You get it? Okay. I'll begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for this day. Again, Lord, I thank you for the students. Just pray you'd uh, be with us today. Help us to uh, glorify you, Lord, in what we do. In the name of prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. So um, this is uh, Elementary Applied Partial Differential Equations by Haberman. Um, it would be for a course which we don't currently have here. And basically, the whole book is about partial differential equations and how to solve them with a focus on uh, something called Green's function. And um, anyway, in this is the example that I was trying to do last time, but I muddled. So let me, let me try it again. This is section 13.4, and it's uh, an elementary signal problem for the wave equation. Now, the reason I'm going over this with you guys is it's completely within the scope of the mathematics we've covered, and it actually gives us a really interesting combination um, of calculational techniques we've done in here, in particular um, Laplace transforms and PDEs. So the problem, and this is the problem for me last time, and I didn't even post the video because it was too horrible. Um, but the problem is just this. We're trying to solve the PDE um, partial squared u partial x partial t squared um, equals to c partial squared u partial x squared. Now, this, this u I called y last time, all right? But I'll just stick with the notation he has in here. And then... Um, u, u of 0 comma t is equal to f of t, all right? And um, so this is our, our boundary condition. Our initial condition is that u of x comma 0 equals to 0, and partial u partial t of x comma 0 equals to 0. <clears throat> so, what we're talking about here is a string. Um, here's a picture of what's going on. All right. Put Mr. Top Hat here. Do, 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 do. There we go. And um, he's got this string that's very, very long, let's say. It's, it's very, very long, and, and it's basically um, taut, held taut. Oh, fine. And he just, <coughs> it's initially just stretched and motionless, just flat, right? And then what happens as time, uh, time goes on, time greater than zero, he applies f of t here, right? Well, it, he doesn't apply f of t. He, he applies a force which causes that end of the string to move up and down according to this function f of t, right? So this is the idea. Hold the string really, really tight, um, initially motionless, and then just take one side of it and wave it up and down. What happens? You guys know what happens, right? Yeah, it'll, it'll kind of propagate a wave across that. So let's work it out. Um, we'll use um, the Laplace transform of u of, um, let's say, um, x comma t, all right, of s, we'll, we'll denote by big U of x comma s. All right, and to calculate that, we'll do like we usually do. The Laplace transform of u of xt of s will be the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus st u of um, x comma t uh, dt. This question? Oh, okay. Now, um, I mentioned last time that if we, um, so we, we want to we take 
partial squared u partial x squared equals to c partial squared u partial, I'm sorry, partial t squared. Partial squared u partial um, partial x squared. I want to take that, I want to take the Laplace transform of that, all right? So as I kind of explained last time, the Laplace transform of that, well, this gives me, by the usual rules, s squared, big U, right, of x comma s. And then that's it. There's no, there's no initial condition terms because we're assuming that u of x0 and partial u partial t of x0 are 0, and this is for all x. All right. So the Laplace transform of the partial squared u partial t squared is just this. And on the other hand, since the Laplace transform has nothing to do with x, the Laplace transform of the derivative of x is just the derivative of the Laplace transform of x. And that's supposed to be a c squared. So we get c squared um, <clears throat> partial squared big U partial x squared. All right. So we'll call this c squared u prime prime with the understanding that's an x derivative, right? And so what we got is we've got u prime prime um, minus s squared over c squared u equals to zero. But we can solve that. That's, you know, here. Um, <clears throat> Well, it's important to notice that the derivative here, this is an x derivative, right? So this is constant with respect to x. So we can just solve by the usual method. And the usual method would tell us that u of x um, would be equal to a e to the s over c plus b e to the minus s over c. Yeah? Secant squared? Where did what? Yeah? Oh, it's supposed to be squared. Sorry about that. That's the speed squared, like we derived last time. But I, had it, I called it v last time here, calling it c today. Sorry about that. Um, now, um, let's see here. But that's not quite accurate. That's not quite honest. I really should say u of what? u of um, x comma s is equal to this. And if you think about it, a and b could, in principle, be uh, functions of s, all right? Now, um, I think for physical reasons, I throw out one of those. Um, yeah, it says we need to put b of s equal to zero to satisfy. Um, so we're physical boundary condition. We want the limit um, as x goes to infinity of u of x comma t to be equal to zero. Um, that's just. Uh, for physical reasons again. So that means that um, that means that we have to set b to be 0 because if b were non-zero that would give a term that was not going to 0 in this limit. So for physical reasons we can argue that this should go to 0.
All right. And so we've got we've got this, right? Now we're looking to solve we want to we want to get u u of xt should be equal to what? It should be equal to the inverse Laplace transform, right? Of a of s um, e to the s over c, right? <clears throat> and I think I've, I'm missing something there. Um, oh yeah, just duh. When you solve this, so this is this is an x derivative. What what's missing? <coughs> this would be like this would be this would be analogous to me, for example, in the first part of the course, having y prime prime, you know, minus four y equals to zero, and then telling you the solution looks like c one e to the 2 plus c2 e to the minus 2. Hopefully, this is an um, answer I will not see at any of your finals, right? Because there's something missing that's kind of important here. Assuming that this is a dy dx, I'm missing x, right? Likewise here, I'm missing x. Okay. And up there too. Now, what have we not used yet? I think I've thrown out the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's exactly the opposite this is supposed to be. I mean, look, it becomes. I've, I've completely, uh, it's the other way around. It's this that's supposed to go to zero, right? Not writing that x there clouded my judgment. There we go. Which means that I've actually got a. You can write this as b, and this is a minus. All right, there we go. Finally. <clears throat> now let me rewrite this in a slightly more um, inviting way. This is bs, um, ooh, wait, no it's not, um, minus, you know, Barbara Streisand here. Let's see here, e the minus, where are we going? Oh yes, um, x, x over c times s. So this would be like e to the minus a s, right? With what? With a equals to x over c. Okay? So this is one of those things we should know how to take the inverse Laplace transform of. How does that go? We're supposed to do what? We're supposed to, we're, we're supposed to say that that's b Right? Of what? Of t minus x over c, right? Times the unit step function of t minus x over c. Where what? Where little b of t is the inverse Laplace transform of big B of s. <clears throat> but what is what is this big B of S? How can we relate that to the data which is given? Well, notice that, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, that's the thing, that's the one thing I haven't done yet. And that's the interesting new thing about this whole problem. Something that we haven't ever encountered before and first time here. What happens, this actually, this boundary condition is a function of time, right? So I actually have to take the Laplace transform of the boundary condition as well. What is the Laplace transform of the boundary condition? We get big U 
of 0t, excuse me, big U of 0s, all right, is equal to what? The Laplace transform of f of t. Right? Which you could call f of s if you like, right? The Laplace transform of the, the wiggle function. But what else is u of 0s is also what? How about here? If we look at u of 0s, what do we get? Put in 0, we get b of s, right? So b of s is f of s, is the point. So <clears throat> that implies then, see, that that little b is actually little f because it's the inverse Laplace transform of big F, which is the given wiggle function. So that implies then that u of xt, if you put it all together here, is just little f of t minus um, x over c times the unit step function of t minus x over c. What is it? Let's see here. So if I was to graph, <clears throat> if I was to graph f of t, right? Here's time. And suppose that, that I'm graphing f. Suppose f looked like this. What would, what would y equal to f of t minus x over c, u of t minus x over c look like? So this, this right here is what? This is going to be 0 for t minus x over c what? What's that? Less than, less than 0, right? Also known as what? t less than x over c, also known as, um, well, yeah, t less than x over c. And on the other hand, it's just going to be, it's going to be 1 for t greater than x over c, right? So at some point, <clears throat> if we can, uh, maybe it's better for me to make, make my, let me try this again. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So suppose my f of t looks like this. All right. So that'll make it easier for us to understand what's going on here. Then if you, I'm graphing both the initial wiggle function and the solution on the same plot, uh, y versus t. Um, <clears throat> if this is x over c right here, what I'd get is the same shape, right? It's just done what? It's shifted right x over c units. That's all this is, is a shift of the graph. So the wave pulse would be the same shape, just like that. So the red is the solution, the black is the input. So it says that the wave that you create is exactly the same as whatever you do to the end of the string. Which if you think about st stretching a string really tight and wiggling it, is exactly what you see, right? I mean, you could in principle send a code by just doing pulses. The same pulses are represented on the string, right? I think this is a ancient method of sig signaling, is it not? Yeah. This is a foundation of certain fictional stories. But anyway, <clears throat> there it is. I like this example, though, because it is, it's an amalgam of all the different things we've done, uh, PDEs and also Laplace transform, and of course, going back to the basics, just solving a constant coefficient differential equation. But um, if you get further into solving PDEs, using Laplace transforms and other integral transforms are a lot of how people think about solving them, right? 
There's also something called a Fourier transform, which is not the same as Fourier series, but it's related. And that's another technique um, which gives added insight, but we don't cover it in this course because, well, we've already covered everything else, right? So, all right, well, that's it. So, can I race? Okay. So that brings us to our third and final uh, PDE to solve, which is the Laplace equation. So um, <clears throat> let me explain to you what the Laplace equation is, why we care about it. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. If you study electricity and magnetism, um, in particular, the case of electrostatics, all right, which means that um, charges aren't moving around, they've kind of settled down, and so so-called electrostatics. In electrostatics, Sort of the critical equation, which is in the middle of everything, is this equation right here. The divergence of the electric field is the charge density divided by epsilon naught. Here, rho is dq dv. This is Gauss's equation, all right? Or we usually call it a law, Gauss's law. Okay, now, you guys who are electrical engineers, you don't think about electric fields that much, actually, you spend a lot more time thinking about voltage, right? In particular, the potential energy per unit charge, which um, I'll use a phi here, um, is uh, the volt, you know, again, potential energy per charge, right? Electric potential energy per unit charge. But anyway, getting to the point, the relation between the electric field and the potential is that the electric field is minus the gradient of the potential function. Or here, tell you what, we're not going to do a lot with this. Let me use a big old V for voltage. There you go. Is that better? Voltage. So, <clears throat> what does Gauss's law say about the voltage function? Gauss's law says then that the divergence of minus the gradient of the voltage function is equal to the charge density divided by epsilon naught. Okay, well, that's not especially enlightening, but if you rewrite it, this is actually nabla squared V equal to minus rho over epsilon naught. This thing has a name. It's called Poisson's equation. And so this is the differential equation, the partial differential equation, which the voltage function has to satisfy in the electrostatic situation. You have to solve Poisson's equation. Now, you guys have had, some of you have had Physics 232, some of you have not. For those of you who have not, you should know, know well enough by now that I'm just giving context here. I'm not actually going to test you on whether or not you understand what I'm about to say. It'd be good if you did. You're engineers, you're supposed to understand these things when you leave here, right? So if the charge density is equal to zero in here, right, then where, are the, where is the charge? It's, right, it's, it's out here, right? Maybe you got some pluses here, you got some minuses over here. I mean, whatever, they, there's... Anyway, the, I'm not trying to uh, be subject to the terms and conditions of Physics 232 right now. I'm just writing an example. Don't read too much into it. The point is, the charge gets distributed to... The, so think about the edge being a conductor. Um, in a conductor, all of the charge goes to the edge, right? Because it repels itself to the skin of the thing. But in the interior of the conductor, you have zero charge density, right? So essentially, rho is equal to zero in the middle, and all the charge actually gets distributed to the edges. This happens in many, many situations. So in this case, Poisson's equation simplifies to the nabla squared v equals to zero. And this right here is what is called Laplace's equation. Laplace equation is Poisson equation with the dense, charge density being zero. There are many other interpretations of this equation. It comes up in many other circumstances. I just find the electrostatic discussion to be most natural. That's how I'm wired, so to speak. Hey, hey pun intended. Um, this, this equation also comes up in the study of fluid flow. If you look at, um, 
you know, the study of laminar flow of fluids, the streamline function has to satisfy Laplace's equation for laminar flow. Um, there are lots of other places Laplace's equation comes up. It's just a natural partial differential equation you face. And so a typical situation for Laplace's equation, and so I'm, I'm not going to use V. We'll, we'll say nabla squared U equals to zero because it seems like we always use U in here. And, and we're, we're actually going to think about something like Laplace's equation on a rectangle. All right? And we'll think about this being 0, 0. We'll think about this being L0. Um, we'll think about this being, I don't know what you guys want this to be, L. What do you want the height to be? H. Why not? I'll make it a capital H. I like my capital H's more. And uh, <clears throat> and so what we want to do is assume that the basically the charge density is zero inside here, right? <clears throat> uh, let's see here, zero H. And here's the situation. We're going to do something like, um, let's suppose that we're given that u of um, x comma h is equal to 0, right? We're given that, um, let's see here, partial Partial u, ah, well, I don't, I can't remember. I should actually probably get out my notes and make sure I'm not making a problem, which is more than we want to solve. <laughs> Just a second, guys. We have seen the perils of me trying to half remember a problem statement at the end of last class. Let me, let me learn from my mistakes, yes? Um, so I'm trying to, what I'm trying to write down right now is we're, we're given we're given boundary conditions on the voltage in this rectangle. We're trying to find, find we're trying to, trying to find u of x comma y in here. Now, this, this um, nabla squared, this so-called um, Laplacian, this, this translates into just u <coughs> x x plus u y y equals to zero in the plane. If you're solving a three-dimensional voltage problem, you got to solve uxx plus uyy plus uzz equal to zero. Or you can look at what that looks like in other Cartesian, like in, in polar coordinates or cylindrical coordinates or spherical coordinates. For example, to, um, this is the kind of thing you have to get into to solve, for example, like Schrodinger's equation in three dimensions. You actually have to look at what nabla squared looks like in, in spherical coordinates. So there's, like, there's a wild world of more interesting things out there, but we'll focus on two-dimensional Cartesian Laplace equation here. So, um, like that. <coughs> and <clears throat> my computer shut itself down yesterday, so it's going to take me a minute. I thought I had it plugged in, but I, told you, I think I told you guys before, my computer doesn't, it looks like it's plugged in, but it's not really plugged in ever since my uh, four year, now, now four-year-old knocked it off the couch. Let's see here. Um, okay, well, if I'm, 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 I'm mimicking example 8.6.1 in my notes, um, but I'm going to do it a little bit more symbolically. My notes actually put L equal to pi and H equal to 1, but I think it's healthy for us to work this problem with a H and L as kind of like variables, um, rather than putting L equal to pi and H equal to 1, although I may, I may regret this in about 20 minutes what I just said. But again, this what we're doing is, is, is roughly um, section 8.6. It's on page 211 of my notes. 
And um, so what we're going to do is I, I gave you that the voltage is zero up here, so to speak. And I'm also going to give you <coughs> that the voltage here, which is L, um, Ly is equal to zero, and U of um, zero Y is equal to zero. These, these will also be zero. But on the other hand, finally something interesting, on the bottom, we're going to assume that there's a given, we've, we've, we've um, you know, put some potential uh, down here. Here we're, we're um, supplying um, u of um, x comma 0 equal to f of x. So you, you can imagine maybe there's like a, um, some sort of strip of resistors down here or something and you, you're dropping voltage from, say, you know, uh, across that strip. Anyway, you're, 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 you're changing the voltage on the bottom strip. And then the question is, what, what's, the correspond, what's the resulting voltage distribution throughout this conducting plate then, given that situation? Mathematically, that problem is solving Laplace's equation. All right, so I, ho I hope you understand the setup. You can do other things, right? Instead of fixing, this is basically grounding these three sides. We're setting the voltage at zero, you know? You could do other things if you insulated. Um, I guess you could, you could do other things like insulate them. Um, there are other boundary conditions you could think about, but we're going to solve this one. <clears throat> I think that'll, that'll suffice for us in here. The technique is going to be very boring, I mean, in the sense that it's just what we did already. So I'm going to start u of x, y, what am I going to set it equal to? What's my generic fundamental building block for the solution going to be? What did we start the heat equation with? x of x times t of t, right? The wave equation, what do we do? x of x times t of t again, right? So here, x of x, right, times what? Well, there's no time, right? We're, this is the electrostatic situation, if you think about that interpretation. So here we're going to look for just a function of y alone, y of y. And that has to sol solve the PDE, the Laplace equation, right? So plug that in, what does it give you? We get x prime prime y plus x y prime prime equals to zero. Which tells us that x prime prime over x is equal to minus y prime prime over y, um, and then, well, we've been here before, right? Function of x on one side, function of y on the other, so it must be a constant. And I'm going to make that constant k, mm, minus k. I mean, here it kind of, I don't know, like you could go k, you could go minus k. I think any way you do it, it's okay. But, eh. Sorry, pun partly intended. Um, so anyway, we face what? We face x prime prime plus kx equals to zero and y prime prime minus kx. <laughs> okay, yeah, x. That makes perfect sense. That should be x. No. Should not. Y, right? Duh. Equals to zero. And all I'm doing, of course, is just solving up here. Now, I think the red boundary conditions are kind of the easiest ones, aren't they? 
I'm not sure which way I should go here, but let's translate the boundary conditions. What, is this, what does this tell us? Let me, let me number this one, two, three, four. So what does one and two have to do? Like one and two, let me just go ahead and write them down here. <coughs> one, two, three, four. So one actually would give me what? That would give me x of zero, y of y equals to zero. Two would give me x of L, y of y equals to zero. Three would give me x of x, y of h equals to zero. And four would give me x of x, y of zero equals to f of x which is not especially enlightening. So I think you can see what does is, what is 1 and 2 tell us, actually? What should x of 0 be and what should x of L be? Zero, right. And, ah, <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and then for three and four, well, eh, kind of a little, I mean, I can, yeah, I've got that y of h should be zero, right? And I also need that y of looks like, well, this is, these are unpleasant. I, I, I'm a little, I'm a little, little, uh, feeling a little apprehensive about three and four. I definitely don't want to start with three and four. I'm not sure what to do with that. Starting with one and two and x, though, the path is clear what I should do there. We've solved this before from the start. This is heat equation with fixed endpoints. Same, like, same mathematics as, as, as this again. I mean, we, we, I can say this much. And we know, we know that we're going to need y of, uh, y of h being 0 for what it's worth. But, um, and, well, let me just say dot, dot, dot. OK, so, but I can solve the x equation, right? So let me call this uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let me call this 5. Let me call that 6. So from 5. I see that k is equal to what? It's n squared, pi squared, over l squared by the first proposition in my chapter again. And what is the x? With x, x sub n, x sub n of x equal to sine of n pi x over l. Right. Fixed, uh, fixed zero, fixed homogeneous um, uh, endpoints of zero. We get sine solutions and the characteristic values n squared pi squared over l squared and just, just set up here. Um, now, maybe I should work that out again, you know, but I'm trusting that you guys understand that I'm relying on our first day we talked about deriving this, right? Okay, now, now that I have that, I can go to 6 and I can solve that. 6 becomes what? It becomes y prime prime minus n squared, pi squared, over l squared, big Y, equals to 0. This is the place where hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine are heroes. <laughs> so 
hyperbolic cosh and cinch are the way to go here. This gives us y sub n is equal to something like, um, you know, let's say a sub n hyperbolic cosh of n <coughs> pi y over l plus d sub n cinch of n pi y over l. Distinct real roots which differ by a sign have cosh and cinch as solutions, natural solutions. And so now, now I'm feeling better about 3 and 4. I think I'm going to be able to hack 3 and 4 by building a blank template solution which I can fit 3 and 4 to. So I'm going to put the x's and the y's together, get a blank template, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take care of that 3 and 4 condition that we were a little bit lost on a second ago. right? In particular, blank template here, u of xt. Oh, xt, what's wrong with me? There's no time for us here. xy, um, sum. Oh. Yeah. Sum n equals 1 to infinity of sine of n pi x over l. And you can either distribute or leave it not distributed. I'll just leave it not distributed. Um, a sub n cosh of n pi y. Why don't I? Oh, there's no h yet. Yeah. Y l um, cinch of n pi y over l. So this is what I would call the quote unquote blank template. I'm basically taking an infinite series of my, um, my eigen solutions to one of the boundary value problems we face. And I'm hoping that I can use those to fit the other set of boundary conditions here. This is a little bit different in some sense than the ones we've done already, right? There's not like this initial condition that's sitting out in distinction. There's x and y. They're both spatial variables. So as much as the technique is the same, it's also, it feels a little different, you know? Sometimes I look back, I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's here. So now this, this we can take care of three and four with, right? Like, which one should we do first? I, I feel like, I mean, you could go either way. Which, which one do you guys want to do first, three or four? Your choice. Three? All right. What? Four. All right. Four says that what? Four says that. Um, I should probably, I don't even like 4, I should go back to where 4 came from, which was u of x0 equals to f of x. So what's that mean? f of x is equal to the sum? Well, I'm going to, let me choose my... Um, I'm going to put x equal to 0 and put y equals to 0 in this, and then I'm going to write equals to f of x to make a point like I've made other days. Sum n equals 1 to infinity. What happens when I put y equals to 0? Where's, what's gone? These guys, right? So we'll just get sine of n pi x over l times a sub n. Cosh of 0 is 1, right? Now, this is given to be equal to f of x. So we want to match f of x up with a sine series. What do we do? We take f of x and we Fourier decompose it, right? You say, ah, well, I'll just rip up, I'll rip f of x into pieces. I'll find the Fourier decomposition of f of x. I know how to do that. I can write this as the sum n equals 1 to infinity of a sub n sine of n pi x over l, where a sub n 
is equal to 2 over L integral from 0 to L of f of x sine of n pi x over L. Right? And then how should the little a sub n and big A sub n be related? This is just the kind of duh case. It's just match them, right? And that'll work. Apparently, we should set. <coughs> big A sub n equal to the little a sub n, which is calculated. like that. <coughs> so I'm happy with your choice of four. It was productive. I don't think it actually matters whether you do four or three first. They all lead to the same ultimate conclusion. It's just how you would preach, approach, uh, preach, how you would preach the solution. Yeah, I don't think that's actually a word. Um, we also have that u of x comma h is equal to zero. Right? What, what's u of x comma h? So I put y equals to h up in here, right? So that gives me, um, well, it gives me a sub n sine of n pi x. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, let me I'm, I'm making work for myself. Let me leave that sine of n pi x over L out front. That's the smart move. And then in brackets, I've got my a sub n, which we already know from the previous step, cosh of n pi h over L plus b sub n cinch of n pi h over L. And all of that's equal to? zero, right? Because we're fixing the voltage at the top at y equals h to be zero. So what do you do? <coughs> in order for that to be true, we need that the thing in big square brackets is zero for every n. We have not chosen, we have not fixed the value of b sub n just yet, so we just need to choose b sub n to make that zero. So set this this must be zero. So therefore, we make b sub n equal to minus a sub n cosh of n pi h over L divided by the cinch of n pi h over L. And there you go. That's how you solve it because we can calculate the little a sub n. I mean, I can make that big a sub n little a sub n, right? To be more. Because I'm thinking of the little a sub n as actually what I get from the integral. But. If you look at what we're doing, we could equally well make the voltage at the top be 10. If I made the voltage at the top 10, how would that change the calculation? It wouldn't change the x part, right? But instead of having a 0 here, you'd have 10. Not true. OK. You'd have 10. 0 is not equal to 10. Not usually, anyway. You'd have 10, and then you could do what? You could write 10. Well, except that you can't do that, I guess. I mean, we couldn't put it to be, I don't think I actually, can I expand 10 as a sine series? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I'm kind of leery of that, actually. I'm not, maybe I can't put 10 there. I feel like physically I ought to be able to put 10 volts out there, so I'm, I must not be understanding not thinking of something correctly here. Yeah? We're trying to find the voltage on the rectangle. So you take, 
basically this right here goes back up in here. And this a sub n is this integral. And so now that we found both of those things in terms of a known integral, then that, that means that this is the solution. So the solution actually is <coughs> this, this right up here is, is the solution subject to that. And that. For, for your problem, you should. But for here, yeah, yeah. We, and let me, let me show you what I mean. I mean, actually, for the problem that I might give you, there's considerable simplification that can be done. Let's look at it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it adds anything to the general solution for me to plug it back in. Like, if you actually had specific H and specific L and specific F of X, then I think you... I mean, if I, if I go up here and, and, and replace that with, with, with integral like that, and then put over here, well, it's the integral times the, the cough of n pi h over l. It doesn't, it's not good. Cough is the, uh, the hyperbolic, <laughs> hyperbolic cotangent, which somehow appears naturally in this problem. Eh. It's funny. All right, let me see if I can find the problem for you guys. <laughs> Some guy who's been watching my, uh, my Calculus 2 videos, and he gets irate because the camera work in there is subpar. It's like been leaving me this series of comments like, this camera person's an idiot. And it's like... So I told him, I said, you get what you pay for, man. But, yeah, sometimes. Um, okay, so. I think I need to follow my own advice. Probably. Practice homework, page 151 to 155, huh? Where'd you go? Yeah, sure, whatever. All right, so here's the, uh, can you hit the, Kang, can you hit half the lights for me? I think, it's, yeah, we can afford half of them. And um, it's like I was saying, if you were in other coordinate systems, the Laplacian is more exciting. Like, here's the Laplacian and polar coordinates. It actually looks like... <coughs> actually looks like this. So to solve, solve Laplace's equation in polar coordinates actually ends up involving Cauchy-Euler problems. That's one of the reasons we study Cauchy-Euler problems is because it naturally comes up in solving like Laplace's equation in polar, polar domains. Um, or the wave equation on a drum, something like that. There's a two-dimensional wave equation, by the way. Two-dimensional wave equation. So this is a principle I should have told you guys about. Basically, partial, partial, partial squared, partial x squared is nabla squared in one dimension. That's the one dimension of nabla squared. So if you want the heat equation, heat equation in two dimensions, what it is is nabla squared u equals to like k times partial u partial t. Instead of having uxx equals to like k times partial t, we have uxx plus uyy equal to k times partial t. And likewise for three dimensions. So with that understanding that nabla squared really is the generalization of the second partial derivative with respect to the spatial variable, you can start to see where these different equations come from. Anyway, let me get back on track. You asked for a specific, let me show you. So here's, this, this problem I actually have this, the, the actual honest to goodness solution written out for. Um, Laplace's equation and the 
Oh, it's a little bit different. So sorry. Here I've assumed that the derivatives are zero on the edge. Um, yeah, zero, so I have zero derivatives on the side, and um, on the on the bottom I'm given four cosine six x cosine seven x for the voltage, and on the top we have voltage zero. So this is like the problem we just worked, but it's a little bit different, right? Because we have derivatives being zero on the edges rather than just the voltage being zero on the edge. What would that mean, by the way? What's, what does it mean if the partial derivative of the voltage is zero with respect to the x coordinate? What's that say? What's the x partial derivative of the voltage, you electrical engineers, you? You're here, aren't you? I mean, there's an electrical engineer somewhere. I'm talking to myself? Ah. What is the x component here? Ex, right, is minus partial v partial x. So if you set the partial derivatives being zero on the edges, that says that the electric field has zero components on the vertical edges. Okay. Anyway, so I solve this the same way we just did. I assume a product solution. I I get that you know we can put a k which is equal to both. We get two related but different second derivative, second order ODEs for the X and the Y functions respectively. Um, I work through it. <coughs> you notice here, I basically have X, e I've got L equal to pi and I've got H equal to what? H equal to one. It's very likely that I do that for your problem that I assign you in the PD project, yeah? which is hopefully going to be posted today. Again, you don't need to work on that before the test unless you want to, but it would be smart to work on it when you have time. Um, I know you guys have lots of time, so it's good. But, um, sorry. Anyway, um, so why do I have so many details here? Compared to what I wrote on the board, why are there so many details? It's because I'm working through those propositions that I have provided for you right, in the solutions here. So I just keep reinventing the wheel, proving those propositions over and over again. And um, So anyway, finally, star star is my blank template. I get to you, and this time, because the derivatives, the derivative zero conditions actually allow for a constant and a y term in principle. That didn't happen for us because we had zero voltage on the edges. So that didn't allow for these. Um, but anyway, I then apply the boundary conditions. For example, u of x0 is supposed to be uh, four, six, four, 4 cosine 6x plus cosine 7x. When I plug in y equal to 0, what happens? This piece goes away, and I'm left with a sub n cosine, right? And so, and then I got a d. So if you look at this being equal to that, you can see that d is 0. And you can see that only a sub 6 and a sub 7 are non-zero. In particular, a sub 6 is 4, and a sub 7 is apparently 1. Ah, see, there you go. Then, what else? Well, we also have the other boundary condition, u of x comma 1. And um, u of x comma 1 going back up to here would give me c times 1 plus um, <clears throat> what's this here? Well this is coming from the the a sub 6 and the a sub 7. These are the only survivors of the whole a series. All right. Um, so you got those guys and then we have these b sub n's to be determined cosine nx cinch of n. Why is it cinch of n? Because y equals 1 so cinch of ny just becomes cinch of n. So if you look at this, this tells us that we must need c being 0, because that's the only constant. There's nothing else to balance it out against. And let's see here. We, have, we also need that b sub n is 0 usually, right? Because the only thing, um, 